What is going on guys and girls and welcome to episode 10 of the Be More podcast and well what can I say about this podcast it's probably the best podcast the most emotional podcast we've done and yeah I want to get just cracking on with the podcast without further ado here it is enjoy guys and be sure to let us know what you think make sure you hit subscribe tag us on in your Instagram stories make people more aware of how good this fucking episode is because Leon's story is just so, so powerful and more people need to hear it and it's just going to raise more self-awareness of so many things that need to be raised awareness of because, yeah, like his story's incredible. He's come through so much and, yeah, that just enjoy the podcast. Make sure you share it with someone you know and, yeah, enjoy. So, today on the podcast we have Mr. Leon Taylor. How are you, sir? Yeah, good, thank you. Are you well? Yeah, good, thanks. Yourself? Good, yeah, good, thank you. And Simon's here for once as well. How are you, sir? Hello, yeah, yeah. Hello. <laughs> cool, mate. So, mate, introduce yourself. Who are you? What's your story? Uh, Leon Taylor, the body Taylor. Love um, it. So, a little bit of back- background from myself. I'm originally from Runcorn. Um, grew up with my mum. And um, I've always worked from an early age. I had a paper round. I had a milk brand and then I sort of fell in with the wrong crowd, as you do, and decided that I wanted to join the Navy. So at 19, I went off and joined the Navy. Um, I travelled all over the world, had some great times and stuff like that, and, but I was always after something a little bit more, so I uh, decided I wanted to transfer over to the Marines, which was like a, a tough course, 32 weeks, and I was at sea at the time on HMS Ocean. 2003, um, we deployed to Iraq, and they needed volunteers to go ashore with the Royal Marines and I was a boats engineer. So we went ashore, um, was ashore for four weeks and then um, went ashore, came back and uh, my life had just sort of changed massively. Um, I was, we got ambushed going up a river so we lost one of my friends, uh, two of the lads were wounded in action. At the time I was going out with my uh, girlfriend at the time, Deborah, and we got married later on and had a beautiful girl, Hermione, who's nine. Um, but my wife was always saying to me, Leon, there's something wrong with you, you need to go and see someone. Because I was having nightmares and flashbacks and as a bloke I didn't really want to talk about it. Yeah. So I just hit self-destruct mode, either work myself into the ground or... Still was, at the marine or...? Uh, no, I was still that? Navy at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, so... Um, I, I was just working myself into the ground anyway, so I decided I would, I'd go for the training, so I went for the Royal Marines training, which is 32 weeks long, and uh, I got to week 17 of training after a year, because I'd had four injuries, all lower limb, so I just decided it wasn't for me, so they gave me the option of leaving the Navy, uh, yeah, leaving the Marines, or coming back into the Navy, so I was just a bit lost, I was honest. Um, How old were you then? So I would have been 20, 24. Yeah, so I come back into the Navy and then I went to watch one of my mates invite me to his PT pass out display, HMS Temeraire, and they were just doing vaulting, doing loads of rope stuff and all. I was like, this is a bit of me. Mm. I, I need something like this. So um, I went on a PT course, which was six months, and then sort of had a, had a great time, but still had loads of issues going on. And like I said, I just massed it over the years. How old were you when it first happened? When the, when you had the issues? Uh, so 20, 23. Yeah. 23. 23, yeah. Um, and looking back now, I still didn't know. Like I joined the Navy and that was to travel the world and stuff like that. When it kicks off, you don't really know what you're doing out there, you yeah. know. I was The Marines are like, they're the toughest course in the UK for a reason. So they're all trained to do that. So when I was out there, I didn't really know what was going on. The lads was telling me what was what to do and stuff like that. So I uh, did my PT course and um, had some good drafts. So, you know, I was based in Portsmouth the majority of my time. I went to sea on HMS Edinburgh. But um, it just got the better of me. Like, it was, like I've always been an active person. And I would find, like, I know what they are now as trigger points. So around about November time, I would just go off the radar. Like, I'd just lie in bed didn't have any energy or you, could, you couldn't get me out of bed, you know, oh, it was like just someone had sucked the energy out of you, I think where I've just been trying to battle it for so long, and usually it was about four weeks, but it just started dragging on November right through to February and stuff like that, and I you think, didn't get out of bed. yeah, just like no energy, I was, didn't, didn't I, go to work, I wasn't going to work, I didn't have any consequences for work, 
and I could always get away with it because it was round April time when we were on Easter leave and stuff like that. So anyway, it was must have been f yeah February 2015. Like I was like enough's enough. So I went to the doctors at HMS Nelson and they were like, we think something wrong with you. Um, I think it's PTSD. So you need to go and see a psychiatrist and stuff like that. So went down to a place called Sunny Walk, which is in HMS Nelson. Did an assessment there and I was diagnosed with PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'm like, Phew, my life's over, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I haven't got a clue what this is all about. This was three years ago. When I was finally diagnosed, yeah. So what post-traumatic stress disorder is, anyone can have it. You know, you could have a car crash, you'll fall over in the road. And your brain should process things. It should you should dream about things. You should talk about things, and the brain processes it, and it stays at the back. So it's still there, mm. but if you need it. But what happens is, if you don't, you know, you don't process it properly, then it stays at the front of the part, and you have trigger points. So it could be like a smell or a bang, and it'll take you right back to that instant where you think, I'm I'm in that instant now. And you still have that now, that if you hear um, that now? Nah, so I would say I have good and bad days. I th the mindset stuff for me is massively helped me. I did therapy, which was um, EMDR, which was like a light therapy, like the old night rider. So basically what I had to do was just go in and talk about the event from start to finish. And then what I do is we just look at this red light like this and she'd stop you about five minutes into it and just say, how are you feeling? And you'd be like, well, I'm a bit upset and stuff like that. She'd like recognise that feeling. Then you'd go on a little bit further and you'd be like, I feel like I need a fight. She's like, just that's adrenaline running around your body. So you reprocess the brain. And then, so we, you meant to do about six to eight weeks of that, but I like, I did three blocks of that. So over time, you reprocess the brain and you recognise those feelings. And then we did this thing, CBT. So she was like, you need to sort of do a diary um, and put some pictures together and you come in and read from the diary each week and it doesn't get as you know as upsetting as it was so I started like looking around and I knew a few lads who'd been who'd got PTSD and I was like do you know what I need to sort of tell your story a little bit there's loads of people with mental health problems and stuff mm -hmm. out there so if I can help someone then I'll, I'll do that so that was it I was medically discharged from the Navy 2016 and I was a little bit lost, I was honest. Like I'd had that military experience and all the lads and stuff like that yeah. around me for years and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I'd always been into fitness, so uh, sort of, I was going with loads of ideas and stuff like that. I, was, I used to drink a lot as well and I would honestly say, I don't think I was over the worst of it. Like I had to go through that transformation period of like leaving the Navy and stuff like that. I went through, cut off all my friends who was in the Navy with, tried to get new friends, you know, like join the gym group and stuff. And then, um, and then from there I was like, I've actually got some good mates. Um, so that, I got back in touch with them. And like me and my wife got separated, so. In the last few years? Yeah, this was probably about, I'd say about 15 months ago because um, I was drinking a lot and I used to distance myself from everyone I'd just go and sit in Weatherspoons, listen to sad songs and stuff like that on my own and just booze up and mm -hmm. that was it because I didn't want to think about that stuff rather than process it so to the spite of therapy that you just started. yeah I'd, I still hadn't, hadn't got to grips with it I knew coping mechanisms like I had to do that scrap yeah, and yeah. I should look at it but I was just like I would say self-destruct mode like and all your mates around you want to help you and you, like they do help but not everyone understands it so um, split up with my wife so we split up and sort of I've got a couple of houses up north that weren't rented out and then we've got a mortgage down here and I've got a daughter and like my morals are I would never see them out of a house so um, I couldn't afford to move anywhere so I was like I was speaking to a mate of mine, Kev Green, and he got me involved in Herbalife, and he was telling me all about this personal development stuff. And I was like, I should really do it. So I was, my mindset was getting better. I read that book there, Who Moved My Cheese, and um, so I was living in my car. Living in your car? Living in the car. So I used to, probably about three, four months. 
So I used to, um, I used to get up in the morning, I'd go to the gym group, get a shout, well, have a workout, listen to some personal development, and then get showered and then go to work. All your mates are like, where are you living then? I was like, oh, just down south, seeing that. Like, because I knew I would get through it after doing all the personal development, I knew that like I would get through it. And how long ago was this? <sighs> that was probably last year, so I'd say November, December 2016 this was. And a few of my mates started to realise that I was I was living in the car and that. And Kev Green was like, you need to sort it out mate, come with me. So Kev put me up in his house, got me back on track and then phew, ever so grateful for him. Like, because we fell out a few years ago through me being an idiot. Um, but Kev massively helped me out and all my mates helped me out. So that was it, As, you know, I read that book, Who Moved My Cheese, and I was like, I've always been a hard worker and just a little bit lost. And yeah. So I was set up the body tailors, which was online stuff, so that was heart rate monitors, because um, I know people can't afford PTs, and I, I wanted to build a community where we could educate people about fitness, about nutrition, and about heart rate monitors and stuff like that, and we could track them. Yeah. Um, but I think you can only, you only got one mouth and two hands, so your message can only go too far. And basically there was four of us who set that up, that was just me and a few mates who got together. So Luke Wilson, um, he's a very good mate of mine as well, and he was the PT. And then we had Mike Young who did all our graphics and everything like that. And then the lady called Sam Lovelace, she helped us out massively, getting us into businesses and schools and stuff like that. Nice. So, and that went well? Yeah, it, it was going well. Like, it, it was all going well. We got Barbell Boutique, which is a gym range where, and I was just spinning a lot of plates again. Again, Kev helped me out. He's like, Leon, you're, just, you're never going to scratch the surface or anything. I was just too busy, like, trying to do this, trying to do that, and I, I was still sort of trying to find my way. Um, and, yeah, that was it. So, I mean, we still got Barbell Boutique, which is running well we've got the the body tailors which i've done some stuff in some workplaces and things like that but um i've got my journey is more with herbalife now i've sort of i realized what a positive impact it has Um i used to be a massive skeptic many years ago i absolutely slated it um, is that why you and kev fell out um i'd say i just sort of distanced myself from kev I, but so kev got involved with it five years ago um, when, when we were both PTs and he was absolutely smashing it, you could just see his passion but it was all he ever talked about, he was trying to get all his mates involved and stuff like that and I was like, God, he's like so pushy and it, I was trying to try the products myself and I give it two days and I was in a PT office and everyone was like, they're a load of crap and I was like, yeah, they're a load of crap like I was listening to that, those negative people mm. um, around me so rather than try the products myself I thought I'll just and that was it and then Kev was trying to get in touch with me and I, I was sort of I was you know not bad marvelling but I was just saying it's a load of crap I don't know why people bother and mm -hmm. didn't really understand it so we, we didn't speak for years a couple of years like anyway um, when I left the Navy me and Kev just got in touch again just going for coffee and stuff like that and we had a great laugh you know he's a cracking lad and he's done so much for me unbelievable um, and he was like just try the products see how you get on so I had some work out in Thailand doing a boot camp so I was like right I'm going to get shredded now so nice. I took the products and like the transformation wasn't even 12 weeks it was about eight weeks and I just ripped up but I was like my confidence was back up I was like oh my god so I couldn't put my like getting a photo about taking my top off and I still didn't have the faith in the products. I Although I knew like it was the products that had done that and it was sorting the nutrition out, I still was still a bit of a skeptic. Mm. So um, that was it. And they were talking about how you can help people out and stuff like that. But again, because they had barbell boutique, because they had the body tailors, I wasn't really ready for any of it. I was spinning all those plates. So I went to a meeting in April last year, listened to Sarah Green talk and she was powerful really just yeah just really hit home with me about like the message and stuff like that so were you living with them at the time or nah i sort of moved out yeah so 
I decided I'm, I'm going to do it, but again, I, it was only st I started doing more personal development and stuff like that, coming on and trying to be the best version of myself that I can be, that, and going to more meetings and being around like-minded people and sort of just educating myself. So when you say personal development, like, what do you mean, obviously? We know so, <coughs> well, I think like, I do a lot of gym rowing, Eric Worry. Every day or? Every single day now, yeah. So what's your routine, in the car, do you read as well? Well, so I'll get up in the morning, I'll listen to something on YouTube, um, if I go for a run or a walk, or I'll get up and read. You'll search something random or you'll just... Um, yeah, I mean, if you go to. on YouTube, like my search history, it just shows you the favourites all the time, doesn't it? So oh, okay, and you just yeah, go to them again? Just go to... Well, it, just see what's on there, so I'll have a look through there. Yeah. Um, and then I've got a client that I PT over in Gosport, so I just put the per put it on in the car, listen, go and train him, and then I'll come back, and then, like, the key thing for me is, like, taking my daughter to school. Like I take her to school every single day, which is like unbelievable, you know, get to spend that time with her. Yeah. And then drop her off and then um, PT a few clients through the day, to get to work out myself. Yeah, and then just touch touch base with people, you know, clients, see how they're getting on. And that's sort of my routine and I go to the meetings. Um, but there's a, I realised how important mindset was and like what, a negative impact people can have on your life. Absolutely. Like I read, I found this poem once, yeah. and it was a, it was about PTSD, and I used to read it every single day. Like, I'll amazing. get it in a minute. I'll read it outright. So now, like I did have PTSD, but I was making it worse with what I was what feeding myself. Yeah. What I was reading, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll get it now and read it out. Were you training when you had PTSD? Was it training? Yeah. Yeah. So you still were definitely going to the gym and stuff? Yeah, was still going to the gym. Uh, yeah. I, for me, it was like routine, getting into that routine. Yeah. <clears throat> so this was uh, by Royal Marine, David Wilburn. Right, so this is it. Um, after your war, you come home again. In outwards appearance, you seem quite sane, but there's anger and pain and nightmares too. Some nights you wonder if you'll ever get through. Your loved ones tell you they really do care and with you the nightmares they're willing to share but you just can't tell them you're locked up inside so all the anger and nightmares you try to hide they finally give up and you drift apart this final betrayal is a knife in your heart your friends have all gone and you're all alone and um, fighting survival now out on your own in sheer frustration you turn to the bottle and begin living your life at full throttle you listen to sad songs trying to cry but the tears won't come however you try Though you try, the nightmares remain, suicidal thoughts enter your brain. In utter despair, you visit a shrink, hoping he'll teach you not how to think. Slowly, the madness begins to subside, as you slope down from this unpleasant ride. With all life's niceties, you want to conform, hoping this insanity will finally reform. Things seem much better, and you're feeling okay, and you think your insanity has gone away. But every so often, it breaks out again, just to remind you you still play war games. So, I used to read that every day. Do you still read it now? <laughs> nah, it's there. Like, I wouldn't look at it every day. If you read that, does it remind you of how you used to feel? <sighs> like, I get getting emotional now reading that. It's yeah. hard for you to read. Yeah, just just emotional. Yeah. So, like my routine would, if, if we've been out night, the night before drinking, yeah. get up in the morning, obviously you've pissed everyone off, your missus and all that. Yeah. And like, I'll be thinking, God, my life shit. Yeah. Like my missus is having a go at me. Um, I've, I've got PTSD. I'm like I'll go and have a drink and read that. Yeah. So you just feed in your brain full of that shit. crap. Are you eating shit as well? Yeah, I didn't. Really, yeah, I wasn't eating good. Just like whatever. Um. So a few things th like I read that book, and I was like, you just need to get back on track. How did you pick the book up? Because there must be resistance. Nah, I just... It was easy for you to read it? Yeah, it was a quick read that was like done in 60 seconds, no, 60 seconds, about 60 minutes. And it was like, it's about four types of people. Yeah. And I was like, fucking hell, Leon. You've always had, you've always worked from an early age, milk round, paper round, all that. You've yeah. always wanted something. You're just a little bit lost. And then, um, again, Kev had mentioned this book about stopping stopping drinking. So 
I thought, do you know what? That's no good for me. So I went mm. to Walk Stones and got the book, but they didn't have the book. It was uh, this one was called How to Kick the Drink Easily by Jason Vale. I was like, he's that juicing lad. So it's going to be a load of rubbish, but desperation, I just grabbed all of it. And mm. remember, I went and sat in a garage lounge, and like the first page is like, um, you probably sat in a coffee shop now trying to hide the front cover in case people see it. And I was like, that. Oh my God. I hope no one sees you reading this. But I was hooked. Round about Christmas time. Was it good? The book? Unbelievable. Well, I've not drank since. Um, not a drop. Not a drop, and I don't need to either. So, it it was crazy as I was reading it. I was sort of going on a journey as well myself with it all. It was just saying like um, we tell our kids and that that it's good to drink around celebrations. You know, when you're eighteen, when you get to a wedding, and when there's a funeral, and they're happy and sad events anyway. So. Alcohol does only fuels that, and they said like we even like and I've done it with my daughter. We sat down at the table, oh, I have a glass of wine and stuff like that. So straight away we're telling our kids that it's cool to have a drink and that. Mm. So for me it was like I need to change what I'm doing there. Then it was like uh, people around you when you stop drinking, like they'll just say to you, "God, you're boring," and I was like, Phew. so. I went, I went out to a place and I was sat in a hot tub with my mates and I was just having a glass of water and all that. And they know what journey I'd been on and they were like, God, you're boring. And I was thinking... Even though they know where you've, yeah, what you've been through. Yeah, like, and they didn't mean anything by it, you know. But we. How, how do you respond to that? I was just, well, at the time I was reading a book and it just made me laugh. It was like, I'm sort of sat back from it thinking, all right, no worries, I'll make my own mind up. Is there and, a voice in the book on how still people give you shit? I didn't even remember that, like reading that bit. I was just like, this is, this I can relate to this. So yeah. I just sod what everyone else is thinking. Like I need to become the best version of me. So I thought, well, we're not exactly doing anything mental. We're just sat in a hot tub. You're drinking Corona and then I'm just drinking water. So, and then it was just um, talked about like, if a kid has a bad day at school, you don't go have a drink, mm. you know, but we do as adults. So, and it's just saying like, the problem's still there. So I was like, the PTSD's still there. I've just, when I'm a bit clouded in the morning, I can't mm. deal with it right. So that was it. And then he's saying kids at parties, they've got no inhibitions and stuff like that. So I was watching my daughter play with her friend and they were having a great time, didn't need a drink or anything. And I was just like, God, I don't know why I've drank all these years. It's just one of them things. You think it's cool when you're 16 to go in the park drink a bottle of Merry down and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, did, I was like, from there, I was like, I'm not going to drink again. I remember driving back and going, I'm not going to have a drink again. But I needed to put myself in that environment. So I like quite into the music scene. So I went to um, an IB for reunion up in Butlins, drove up there and then um, my mates were like, you having a drink? And that I was like, nah, nah, I'm all right. Honestly, as if I needed to, to have a drink, I was like, I'm just taking it in. Um, like I took a bottle of water and that was a bit thinking, God, I can't drink water. They're like, you can do whatever you want, you know. And then people were coming up to me like, what are you drinking? I was like, just water. And they go, God, you're boring. I was like, okay, mate, no worries. Like, I think the worst thing over the weekend was I just was so hungry because no one wants to eat. So I was like, just want to get a load of food and that. And then like, I had a good night. People just deteriorated through like leaving early and stuff like that. I stayed out till three o'clock, got up the next morning cooked some good food, went for a run, like everyone was still in bed. And then um, I, like we went to the event the next day. Some people missed it. I was like, I drove back and I remember the sun was setting as I was driving back. I was like, Phew. I just knew then that I wouldn't drink again. Like, and I've not. Nice. It doesn't, it doesn't, the only thing it does for me is just, make, you know, I can't process anything. So you think that was the best thing you could have done with regards to yeah. making the PTSD kind of go away? Yeah. It was 100% just not drinking. And your friends accepting of the fact you don't drink now? Yeah, you know, still got mates who, who take the mick a little bit, you know, but I go out all the time. Um, One of the things you mentioned quite a few times is your daughter, and it's amazing to watch on like your Instagram stories <coughs> and your Facebook and stuff is the relationship you have with her. So do you think that helped you with your PTSD? I think, um, like, when you know you why, and like I think behaviour breeds behaviour, so read a lot on habits and stuff like that. And you know, 
as a kid we get told we can't get down from the table so we've eaten that, what's on our plate so we're encouraged to eat big portions from an early age like people skip breakfast so I think like my actions are going to help her in later in life and I just want her to you know be the best person that she can be and do whatever she wants to really like everyone's so focused on getting maths and English and stuff like that and you know she loves dancing and she has a great time doing it so I just want her to be happy and if she sees my work ethic you know that I put the hours in that then hopefully that'll follow on yeah she's smart isn't it yeah she <laughs> Um, uh, before we came, obviously, Jack said, oh, Liam's got an unbelievable story, you know, and uh, it's amazing listening to you, obviously, because as well, I've seen you at the gym a couple of times without knowing any of this at all. Yeah. I would never, ever have imagined any of it at all, and yeah. it's amazing to hear where you were and how far you've come. So, yeah, thank yeah, that's you. awesome. Yeah. yeah. What's what, 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 you're living in your car? It's just ridiculous. Yeah, I would never. I've lived in South Sea though, so it was all yeah. right. Oh, yeah. I would never. Where I you live in Port Solent? Yeah. Was never. it the summer? No, I was freezing. I had a sleeping bag. <laughs> well, like it was in the forces, so I'd done all that anyway. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. How do you like charge phones and stuff? <laughs> did you on the in the car there? Just use the and then at work. Stuff like that. Just Same set, car you got now. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, you got you know decent car. You'd I never suspect yeah, that you. I could have got rid of that, as you know what I mean, and probably saved a bit of money. But I was like, I just knew that I would get through it. Like that positive mindset and honestly, visualization and stuff like that. And like I was listening to like, there's loads of different people you listen to Conor McGregor driving around in his clapped out car all yeah. those years ago and stuff like that. And I was just like every night I used to go and sit in the garage lounge well that was one of my routines I used to go and sit in the garage lounge till like 10 o'clock at night and read and then I'd just go and get my head down and I'd get up in the morning just routine 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 yeah so what's the future hold now for you um, exciting times um, you know for me I'm all about herbal life now I want to educate people about it I think you were the first were you I think that's key yeah. to add so yeah. you were, <clears throat> did you think about it? You, obviously, you said years ago you kept trying to get you into it. Yeah. What made you change your mind? Um, I just trying the products myself, going to the meetings and being educated myself. Um, yeah. So why is there such stigma and dogma about it? Probably because people like me, like a PT, who doesn't know. You know, I'm not a nutritionist. I've done nutrition courses, but you know, and me slagging people off. And you know, for no reason. For, yeah, like, for no reason. Slag them off because your mate yeah. said it's because he's rubbish. doing well. And then your mate said your mate's yeah. mate doing it because he said it was a load of rubbish. Yeah, hey, yeah, you know, everyone slates people, don't they? You know, people who do CrossFit and things like that. People who, you know, you just, there's something out there for everyone with with fitness. Yeah. You know, whether you jump on a cross trainer, whether you jump on a rower or CV, as long as you're you're enjoying it. And that's, and that's the thing with it, like my PT and the education I want to you know there's not a template workout you know you should be able to give people their goals and stuff like so that so you're still doing barbell boutique now yeah at the minute yeah so tell us about that is that um, so that, that was wrenches and stuff and so that was a friend of mine um, Scott Jackson he, he, we were both in the Navy together on PT course and he phoned me and he was like Leon I've, I've got a new job Sit Bob over your teacup, but I want it to go into the right hands. And would you be interested in taking it on? And to be honest, it wasn't on my radar, but I was like, I was reading stuff about opportunities and how you should never pass an opportunity up. So, uh, this is crazy as well. Before I'd bought Barbell Boutique, I'd wrote Barbell Boutique, I'd never even bought anything from Barbell Boutique. I went back through my book and I'd wrote Barbell Boutique tracksuit. Because I said to Jacko, unless you get a barbell boutique full tracksuit, you used to do mismatch colours. I'm never going to buy anything off you. And then I ended up buying a company off him. And then I ended up launching my own tracksuits. Um, so a few of us invested in that and, and we put it out there. We got the tracksuits out there. They're the same colour. Yeah, same colour. Yeah. So is it like gym clothing? Yeah, gym clothing. So we've got tracksuits, we've got t-shirts. Just for guys or? No, we do women's leggings and stuff like that. Are you trying to push that still now, or is it more um, like I don't want to do it any injustice. Like we've got, you know, there's four of us involved, and and Jack will give me that for a reason. So I just want to make sure that it's up and running, and we can provide the best service that you can. You know, if someone puts an order in, you don't want to be 
if like letting them down and it's five days, it should be there two to three days, you should be able to provide that service. So we're just finding the right suppliers and that for, yeah. for that here. But your main vision now is obviously growing the business for life and helping people that way? My thing is, I just want to help and educate people, right? And me selling them a gym wear tracksuit doesn't do that. He's not going to do that. Me educating them about Herbalife could, you know, change their lives. Absolutely. Health and wealth. So, mental health, like, especially in guards, is like, like all, it's crazy right now. There's more guards committing suicide than ever. Like, mm -hmm. How can, what, what, what would you recommend to try and, to a guy who's listening to this who's going through some kind of mental health problem? What, what advice would you give guys who are going, or even girls going through mental health problems and what's the most powerful thing you did that would help anyone? Because obviously you said you went to see a therapist, but you were still having problems after the therapist. It wasn't that, I feel like it was yourself who solved your problems. <laughs> yeah. What was the most powerful thing you did? What, what would you say to read. go actively do? Read reading and listening to some positive stuff like like i said anyone who's got a trauma you've and it could be anything it could be a car crash it could be and it's you know someone getting knocked over and um, but you've got to go through that trauma i think you've you've got to hit rock bottom like you can keep making mistakes and getting in trouble all the time you know i was getting in trouble at work but not enough trouble to get sacked or you know for someone to say what's what's going on in your life there so like i took that trauma i took that dip and you know i've lost a lot because of it um and there's like there's i didn't even see that much you know the, the lads they got ambushed but it was me trying to fix the landing craft afterwards a lot of guilt that i couldn't repair the landing craft that i went through of that and some of the stuff that i saw yeah I th you've got you do it yourself like your friends and all that will they genuinely do care and they'll offer you so if someone's offering that advice i would say listen to and grab hold of that olive branch because they've probably been through it themselves and they know what they're talking about so when they're trying to say to you do some reading go and see someone then you should go and is it still hard for you to talk about it now nah i mean like i said i read that and I'm like Phew. You know, I wear my heart on my sleeve. Yeah. Um, not really. I mean, I'll do, once this is finished, I'll show you through some of the stuff that I did there. Yeah. Um, it still upsets me. Like remembering Sunday, I go down to the I go down to the guild hall, take my daughter down, you know, and shed a tear there. I remember that. Um, but I can section it off now. It's at the back. Mm. I know, and that's another thing. Being in the here and now, and being in the present. Like, I'm not in Iraq. It's not, you know, fireworks going off and that is just fireworks going off. It's nothing else. Yeah. You know, there must be so many servicemen and women who are going through it and, you know. Do yeah. you still wear the mask? Nah. It's gone? Well, like, so I'm upbeat. So I'm on Instagram, I'm there to motivate and inspire, like, and be as daft. That is, as you see me, uh, there would be, like, days when I get down, like, I remember I saw you in um, the garage lounge on Remembering Sunday. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was that day, wasn't it? Yeah. And I was like, I took my daughter down to um, watch the parade and everything like that. And then I dropped her off with her mum. And I watched uh, the Festival of Remembrance. So I remember sat in the house watching it. I was like, crying my eyes out. And I was like, what should you do? And like, I would have just gone out and just got pissed. I was like, you need to do, you've got a new habit now, go and do something else. So I remember I went, just went and set the garage down and got my book out and read. Yeah. And like, I was fighting it then, you know, sh do you put that on Instagram and stuff like that? I mean, I'm telling this story now. Like, yeah, there's tough times and everyone has tough times. Yeah. Every single one. The thing with Instagram and social media is just a highlight reel, right? Whereas... I think like... People I mean, can see you singing on Instagram story, yeah, which is great. It's your your really positive influence. But at the same time, I think your story now yeah. is like a million times more powerful. So how can we try and make maybe social media a bit more honest, you know? But at the same time, to expect people to it's difficult, right? I wouldn't want to put like me being negative. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, me I not, get you. If I go, oh God, I'm having a shit but day. Everyone's having a shit day. Yeah, no, but like so I wouldn't they, want to drag everyone. You don't know what you mean, but then if they can relate, I think. He's like this inspiring guy who I see every day. He feels shit as well. 
Whereas uh, they seem to think these people are just always crushing yeah, it, they're always true. doing well. Yeah. And it just it's it makes the people feel shit. Whereas if they oh, this guy feels shit too. Yeah. Fucking hell. Then they can they can relate to you, whereas if they think you're this happy guy who's singing in the car all the time. Yeah, no, that's they, true. They almost don't realise I didn't know. Like until I met you for a coffee last week mm-hmm. I didn't know that you had PTSD, like I just thought you were the happiest guy ever. Yeah. Which no, is, a, which is credit to yourself. Says, I don't know, it's like having more than happy to do something. Yeah, yeah, but the the, the mark, the mask of masculinity is yeah. like massive, isn't it? All, all guys wear a mask. <coughs> yeah, uh, like especially as a PT. Last, yeah, I'll give you the book. It's amazing. Actually, I think it's an audio book I read. But it's it's literally called the mask of masculinity. How guys wear masks yeah. all the time. I think like um, especially as a PT, like we're into group fitness, we go out and motivate and all that, and you yeah, want to be yeah. like that, a ball of fire. So yeah, I just sort of went off that. But you're right, you know. And social media, it's scary. It's scary. Like, I listen to Sam Sinek, greatest yeah. speech ever. Yeah. Um, about social media and you know that dopamine effect and what it's doing to our kids. Yeah. Like I'm very cautious of what Hermione sees and does. Do you have rules for her with social media? Um, she's not got. She's not got an Instagram account or any Facebook like that. She does have a phone. Um, she she lost it the other day because she put it on top of the car. <laughs> but I, I'm happy with that. You know. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, you know it is scary. Social media. Yeah. So it, think, if it's in the wrong, wrong hands. So how? Yeah. How do we get take the mask off? Off myself, you mean? Or how would you recommend other people to do it? Or what? Like obviously, I think exercise is great for it. Oh, your mindset, exercise. the way you eat. Yeah. Your health, obviously, sleep's great. Yeah. Reading, YouTube videos, whatever it might be. Is there anything else that you'd say, right? To get the mask, is it the people who surround yourself with as well? Do you think? Yeah, massively. Yeah, you know the people that surround yourself. I listened to one, um, Eric Worry, and he was talking about like he used to listen to Jim Rohn and stuff like that, and because he was surrounded by him all the time, even though he wasn't there, he was just playing on in the car. That's how he become self-educated and stuff like that. So you and Kev talk about Jim Rohn a lot. Like the people who don't know who he is, who is Jim Rohn? Um, so he was a farm boy from Idaho. Um, became a multi-millionaire um, and he got involved with Herbalife he's, they've, in fact there's a great one on YouTube Why Herbalife and he talks about he's just motivational he talks about self-education um, self-belief law of averages you know and I think you can teach yourself a lot I've I've learned more in the past year than I did do at school yeah yeah I think I can say the same to be fair from my reading <laughs> yeah how many books have you read in the oh, last year? I'd probably say about 15. Yeah, 15. Do you listen to books as well or do you listen nah, to YouTube? No, but I'm going to have to start doing that because um, we had a conversation with Kev the other day and he was like, we're just reading one at a minute, think which girl which and he was like, oh, do you remember that bit? I was like, no, nah, I can't like my attention span. And sometimes I get through a book and I'm like, I don't remember what those last two pages are about. If you're having a bad day as well, can you read? Like, can you take it in or is, is it, can you not, like, can you switch off from the bad and read? Like not. so, my th- like I'll go and sit and have a coffee. And you can you can actually look in the book and you can read it. Yeah, like and that's another thing is like <clears throat> it's all good to like surround yourself with positive people, but think like you need time on your own as well. Absolutely. Like, would you say you're an extrovert or an introvert? I don't even know what that is. So the extrovert is like you're out there. I think a, an introvert is basically when you're you need a lot of time on your own and you're like a person that needs time on your own, but. Yeah, it's hard to explain what it basically is, but not extra about someone who's really out there. I need to, I, I'm a bit of both, I do need yeah, to. Yeah, I, I can I, imagine, I can see on social media you're an extrovert, but now I'm going to feel like you're an introvert. A bit of both, yeah. And like, I need, I need, I've got to have a balance, so I've, I've, I need to take that time. So there's things that I need to do, like um, go and have a coffee somewhere, I need to go and have a read and stuff like that. I've sw- sw- started switching my phone off now and I'm doing all that. So do you feel like in the last year you've become more self-aware and what you need to do to make you feel great? Massively, yeah. So self-awareness is big as well. Yeah. But we're, everyone's so busy, aren't they? You know, we get up. I could I could write write my life out what it was. You know, finish work on a Friday, go out drinking, hungover, get grief off someone else, off your missus and all that, go drinking again. Saturday, Sunday, get up for work Monday, go to work, you know, finish late. Go on, watch the telly. It sounds like you've got a lot more control over your life now as well. Um, that sounds like it helps. Like obviously before, you're pretty much working, drinking, yeah. getting grief from whoever it is. Whereas now, it sounds like you're you're actually taking control, and you're like, right, 
I need 10 minutes to myself, I'm going to go and have a coffee and read, yeah. and I need an hour to myself, I'm going to go to the gym or whatever yeah. it is, and that helps you, is that right? Yeah, definitely, it's that, it's like that rat race, and not, not everyone, I mean, my job, PT and herbal life and that, I'm fortunate enough where I can do that, I can manage my own diary, but if you're on a job where you back to back and, you know, we had a conversation the other day, like you could be PTing clients all day long, and never have any time for yourself. Mm-hmm. But you need that time for yourself, you know, when you're PT and you, or when you're talking to someone, you need to be a ball of fire. I was going to say, you need the yeah. time to yourself to give the best to the, the best, best service. Yeah. 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 Do you have any like time management hacks or anything you put in place to make sure you're making the most out of the time you've got free? Um, like, I've, my phone was my biggest distraction. Like, and again, I listened to Jim Rohn, he was like, when you're at the beach, be at the beach. When you're at work, be at work. When you're with your family, be with your family. So I've started putting my phone away now and, and just being in that moment, in yeah. the now, and just enjoying it. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. They're the little shit things, isn't they? Them devices, they take up all your time. <sighs> yeah. But, you know, how else you get your message out there as well? 100%. It's just having that balance, isn't it? Yeah, it is that balance. But I noticed that when I met you and thought the other day, you were just like, I know you with me, yeah. but with, with her, you were just good as gold. And I think it'd be cool for you guys to talk about like parenting anyway, I think. Because I feel like. Yeah, like I said, it's amazing. It isn't done very well yeah. <laughs> everywhere else. Like, I'm not a parent, so it's hard for me to say, but. Yeah, it's see. amazing watching, like, on your Instagram and that sort of thing. Oh, I try to do the best for my daughter and give her my time and attention when I'm with her. Difficult when you're your phone and that side of things. Yeah. But, you know. Like same as you, she's a reason, and my son's the reason I'm doing, working all the hours and working, working hard, and all the rest of it. But it's it's nice to watch because I don't know, kids have still got like your daughter's obviously really mature and grown up, but at the same time she's still got the young innocence that she wants to play and dance and doesn't care who's watching her and yeah. you know the fact you're videoing and stuff like that. So yeah, m- amazing to watch, isn't it? Yeah. So how old are yours? Uh, so two, uh, three and eighteen weeks. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Good well, times. It's crazy how much they'll pick up your behaviour as well. Like you said, so if you were to be drinking all the time, like that would not be good. Or if you were eating shit, and she just yeah, that just wouldn't be a good. Nah. Way for her to grow up. It's amazing now as well. Like I was saying to Jack earlier, my daughter watches a lot of videos on the iPad, and it's like a real mess with my head do you let her watch them because she's learning some things but do you let her watch them because then she spends a lot of time on the ipad you try and make sure they're educational on like counting and abc and all the rest of it yeah but then a lot of them are quite american so she then comes out with some really american like ways of saying things and you know it's amazing how influenceable they are from yeah. you know how much they pick up from what they're watching yeah and like I remember doing it with Amani, just like when she was a baby, just put me in front of SpongeBob SquarePants, just watch the telly there while I go and do the hoovering or something like that. And it's like, just wondering if there's something you could do. You know, I'm sure there's been studies on it, like on stuff, like especially mindset stuff. I know I'm not going to listen to Jim Rowan, but if mm. you could get something from that early age. Yeah. But surely if she sees you eating healthy fruit and vegetables, yeah. she must think, oh, I'm going to do that. Daddy does that. Yeah. Or if she sees you reading all the time. She's gonna mirror that behaviour. Whereas if you're drinking, yeah. eating hot dogs, oh, like yeah. she's like, yeah, hot dogs. Days for hot dogs. Yeah. You know. Whereas if you're just being this great example, yeah, I think more parents need to do that. I, I think you've got to have that balance as well. It's like on my social media, I put that I have cake and like have ice cream because you, that's real life. You do have that. Yeah. You know. And if you're saying to your kids, you can't have that. You can't have that. Guess what? They're gonna go and do it and want it even more. Exactly. And then you probably flip them the other way. Yeah, so then, uh, then when they when they're when adult, they yeah. eat it because they're out. Yeah, get that in. Do you think with the alcohol thing as well? Because I so I stopped drinking when I was sixteen, oh, seventeen yeah. for like three or four years. Yeah, because I I knew somebody who went out drinking and they got hit by a car and unfortunately passed away. So I stopped drinking because at the time I was going out with my friends all the time, like fourteen, fifteen, getting completely smashed. And the thing is at that age as well. You know, like a vodka and coke is, you know, a normal pub measure of vodka and coke is like one shot or two shots of vodka, yeah. but you think you're really hard when you're that age and you put 90% vodka and 10% coke, you just drink so much. It, you know, I could have, um, you know, I just sort of think the writing was on the wall that I was like, actually what's the difference between me and that person is that it's just one unfortunate incident that's happened 
I need to ease up a bit because I'm completely out of control with, yeah. you know, not, I didn't drink too much or anything, but I would just realise, hang on a minute, I'm a bit too young to be drinking and, yeah. uh, you know, I think because I've got a really addictive personality, I knew that it was either going to be I'd knuckle down and work hard or I'd have too much fun. Unfortunately, I was really into my sport and that sort yeah. of thing. So do you think, um, do you think that's helped you with your, you know, the fact that you've, you, you drank so much, you kind of got it out of your system, and you, although you had to com- come clean and stop drinking, you yeah. think the fact you, you drank so much was kind of done out of your system, you needed to get, you know, box it off, I guess. I think, like, um, being in the here and now, what you're saying is, like, it was a big one for me. Like, I still go out, I still go to that environment where I go out with all my mates and I still go raving and stuff like that. And that was like, he was like, whether you have a drink or whether you have a pill, that music doesn't change. It's being in the moment, like when that music comes on in the, you know, in the car and you hear it, you're like, Phew. so I was like very conscious of that. I was like, I don't need it. Like if you just look around, around you, you're still having a good time. And you remember it the next day. And, and you remember it the next day. Yeah, yeah. And you save a fortune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I can imagine, like when I was going, out and I wasn't drinking. I used to drive every Friday, Saturday, I went to Tiger, like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I went to Tiger every week. Yeah. And I didn't drink and I'd always be the one who drive and drop people home and all the rest of it. But I, um, I probably enjoyed it far more than they did because, you know, I could be the most off the wall person or whatever, but I didn't need to drink to do that. Yeah. So I'm glad I, I'm glad I. Now, that, and that, that is a true you as well. I'd say that, like, me singing and stuff like that, that is me, that's who I am when I'm out. People go, what well, you like that when you, when you don't have a drink? I think like when you have a drink, you sort of lose confidence as well. Mm. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's actually good. Um, I've, you know, I've learned so much there. It's really good. Definitely. An unbelievable story. Yeah. You should tell it more, mate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean... Your story so inspiring. The people yeah. I think that's going to go nuts. Yeah. It's been a massively motivational. It's leaving your car. <laughs> so, the living here, it's and really, it's really cool. like no one can see existence, yeah. but this is like a real nice really partner. Nice it's crazy how far you've come, and I can imagine in a year, in a year yeah. as well, you're going to be yeah, flying yeah. because you're on like, this path now. So I reckon gone off. Yeah. yeah, we'll see you there, mate. We'll get get back together. Room with a view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. It's all just down to self development, right? <sighs> Definitely. Three books. Go on. What would you read? Top three. Who moved my cheese? Yeah. One. The drinking one. The drinking one. What was it called again? Um, How to get drink easily by Jason Vale. Two. One more. Oh, that was a tough one. Has Jim Rohn got a book or not? Um, or he's got audios that you listen to? I just, I've just listened to all his audios. I don't right. Think you might have a book. So I've read The Secret, right? Is but that good? It's that is good. One. But I met this lad um, about six months ago, John Paul Ross, and we were. At a Herbalife event, and I said to him, um, Oh, where are you from? And he went, Liverpool. I went, oh, I'm from Runcorn. He went, Oh, I'm from Runcorn. I was like, Why didn't you just say that? He went, No one usually knows where it is. So we were just having a chat, and then we knew people that knew each other and stuff like that. And he asked me for my address, <coughs> and he sent me a book. It was called a gratitude book. Right, so you just write in there every day three, day, three things that you're grateful for, and then your intentions you know, a bit of visualisation, what you want, and fill that in every day. And like, although it's not a reading book, you appreciate what's going on in your life when you take it. You still do that now? Yeah. So, hopefully you don't have a question. What do you think is the most common thing that you put in the book? Most common thing you write down? Um, time with my daughter. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Do you do gratitude? Yeah. Every day? Every time, I, every, every day when I wake up, I think, I'm grateful for this. That, you write it down? Um, no, I don't write it down, but definitely should do. And then before I go to bed, I always think, right, what's happened today? What have I achieved today? What have I enjoyed about today? So, yeah. yeah. So, is it like a journal you're on? Because I've got like a journal, it's called Best Self. It's just got like a blank page, probably about 20 lines in there you can fill in. So, okay. I use it, yeah. Normally, I write down my phone so I can look at it every day and then yeah. like write a to do list for the next day, things I need to achieve. At the same time, write down what I'm Grateful for chief that day. Yeah. What the plan is for the next day. But I did another event. It was something similar. Susan Peterson. Um, she said that just ask yourself three questions: What moved you? What surprised you? What inspired you? 
every day. At the end of the day. At the end of the day, you yeah. start to take it all in. It's become more self-aware when you do that because you're constantly thinking about life, whereas life just goes so fast, you're just like, it gets in the day and you're like, what even fucking happened today? Yeah. Whereas when you become more self-aware and you become more like, control your time, <coughs> you get more done and the needle all of a sudden moves this much further because this is why this next year for you is going to be crazy because you're actually aware of what you're doing, you're consciously controlling everything, yeah. well, which is exciting. I don't, how do you get that message, you know, how do you tell people to sit back and sort of take their own time? It's yeah, hard, it is it's hard. It's like it is hard, but we can only try, can't we, by yeah. like these channels and just yeah. one step at a time, one person at a time. Hopefully, with every client you train or whatever it might yeah. be. It's like your books as well. You start can, to change people. You can yeah. recommend all these books to people, but mate, write a book. Yeah, they've got to go and get it themselves, haven't they? It's like I knew about that book about giving up drinking. Would you write a book? Um, would I write a book? Yeah, I'd write a book. I think what's quite cool is actually story, some of the it? some of the books that you've read that maybe most motivated you other people have given you. So yeah. the gratitude book you obviously given yeah. and yeah. the drinking book Kev told you, get yeah. this book. So you know, uh, it's quite cool because hopefully someone will watch this or you'll give someone a book yeah. and I oh, know you gave a book to Jack's so, you? so hopefully well, that's that's it, I think like, be yeah. great for what you've given. It's them. gratitude, you know, you could just they just might read something that they can relate to. Yeah. You know, and, and again, Jim Rohn keep quoting him, like, there's what he says, like, there's books on how to become a millionaire <laughs> in Waterstones. You know, do people buy it? Nah, no. they don't. When they could go and read it and take some action on what they're selling them. It's nuts, isn't it, how you can buy a book on how to be a millionaire if people spend the money on McDonald's every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We can feel ourselves with good information to make a difference. I'm not saying money but makes you happy, but people spend their money on just fucking feeding themselves shit all day or, or yeah. reading things that's negative, yeah. like social media, Facebook, scrolling through Scroll all day. Yeah. And they wonder why the world's going through the worst mental health problems and obesity problems. Yeah. We're not helping ourselves, are we? No. I'll show you these, what I did. Don't mind. Yeah, yeah. These were like. So she said I needed to write a diary. But I was like, I'm gonna do like my full journey from like when I when I joined the navy, stuff like that. So I did it. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Don't look like you, mate. <laughs> so that was me. Joined at 19. You've got better age, mate. Oh you? no, mate, yeah, it's like I'm <laughs> um, That was all the lads I joined up with. That was my stepdad. Um, my mum, my brother. These are just some of the, like when I did my basic training and things like that. My first ship, I did adventure training. Like, I had some great times in the Navy. It doesn't even look like you, does it? I don't know. Um, out with your bottle, like, first from the shore. Like, again, the forces are just like, I had a great time, but the culture is just drinking culture. Yeah. Like, we went to some amazing places, and all we did was go and piss up. When you could have gone and seen like yeah. half, unbelievable. So yeah, that was it. Went to like Mumbai and stuff like that. So how many countries have you visited through the Navy? Um, you know, was it a lot? Nah, I couldn't tell you. It's a lot though. Yeah. And then this was it, Octelic, so Plymouth went out on HMS Ocean. So I met Debs down in Barmy, told her he was a dolphin trainer. <laughs> um, and then we deployed in January and we were like so we were working with Royal Marines out there that was the landing crafts and we had four of those and then we went out to Cyprus so that was a lad called Jonah he got wounded he got um, shrapnel through his leg and then that was Damo so that was just all was doing our training and stuff like that when we were out there. How often would you look back through these? Um, I went and seen Debs today and she was like, are you going to take your clubs there? And I was like, yeah. And then so I took them and I took this. So like, I've not looked through this for ages. So like, these were all the lads. So these are nine assault squadron. So, like, you know, the landing craft, like, um, saving Private Ryan, going on the beach. So our job was to go through a rack and sort of ahead of enemy lines. So that was all the lads there, just out there. This is really cool. 
So we were out there for four weeks. There's two rivers, Shuttle Arab and uh, KA, and we went up the Shuttle Arab. So our job was to just, um, there, was a, there was a border where they invaded Iraq south, just a Basra. So like, when it first kicked off, March the 17th it was, there was like bombs and chemical alarms going off and stuff, like see us in our respirators there, I was absolutely shitting us. Like I just didn't have a clue, the lads were like, yeah, yeah, because they, <laughs> I wasn't trained to do what it was. Like yeah. they looked after me, some great lads. Um, so yeah, we just made our way up the riverbed, and then um, it was on, they'd heard like, there's a documentary, it's called Fighting the War, it was on the TV. So it was a crossing point, which was called at Hannah, and they did four minutes of radio intelligence, so they thought it was Iraqi Special Forces, so what they did, they sent two landing crafts to go up and down, and act as like a deterrent, um, and we were back further down south, so the lads were up there, and we were going to take over in the morning about seven o'clock and it come in through the net the radio contact went out so they'd been uh, being ambushed so we shut up and we went after them and they were coming down towards us um, and all the windows were blown in like the mass was down and they were like got two lads in the water so we went up and got two of the lads one had got shrapnel through his leg and then um, one who just fell in the water, he had all like white bits on his mouth, don't forget it. Um, so we stayed out, um, there was like loads of shots going off and like huts getting burnt down and stuff like that and we'd got, gone out at 7 o'clock in the morning and come back late at night and when we come back like we didn't know anything and then we found out Chris had gone to the hospital, then we found out Chris had died that night so like everyone was in, in bits you know what i mean so after that the, the morning after i had to uh, they asked me if i could fix the, the landing craft like so i was the only lad i was the only engineer 23 and um obviously like proud men the marines so i went to f and then opened the door and like stood there was i remember it was like crushing glass on the floor there was um there was in like an insert wound, so like you got a small hole, and then you got where it goes out the explosion, you got an exit, so it's big and then small and then massive, and then there was like blood and stuff like that. And remember, there was a map, and that was all ripped up and stuff like that. And so the consoles, there was no way the like engine would ever start again. Like, and I knew that I couldn't fix it, but I didn't, I didn't want to go and tell the lads that I couldn't fix it. I was like embarrassed that I couldn't fix it, so. I went down and lifted the engine hatch up and I just shut it on myself and I was like, that's right. I don't know how long I was down there thinking, gutted, gutted that Chris had died. Like, gutted that I couldn't fix the landing craft and I felt like a lot of guilt. Like, I had that one job to do, which was to fix it. And I think that was what I carried with me for ages. Mm. Um, so, yeah, he got killed out there. And then sort of came back from there, first... <laughs> Ended up marrying Debs, um, went back on the ocean, yeah, married Debs, and that, that was sort of it, you know, kept in touch with a lot of the lads, and that, that was the journey, so I put all the different ships that I'd been on and stuff like that, um, when I went down to the Marines as well, so I went down to Dimmer Marines training, and um, I got a, I was in week, 10 of training and to see all the lads there with the green berries um, I got called up because I was I got given a commendation by the chief of joint operations because I'd volunteered to go with the lads when we were in Iraq so I got that there they were all these lads who were in the green lids they'd all been in Iraq and stuff like that and they were like because that black one was like basic training like what's he doing here and I was like oh, I was out with the lads on that assault squadron so yeah that was it just my time in the Navy, but like, that was out, that was out there. I've got one more question to you. Yeah. You're in the cab, 18 year old Leon walks in. Oof. What do you say to him? What's your advice? That is a tough question. Good one, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what I say? see myself at 18. Yeah, you see yourself at 18 and you, let's go back, I don't know how old you are, how old are you now? 37. So going back to 19 years, what do you say to yourself to, to, to give yourself maybe 
one little bit of information to maybe, maybe change things or do things differently? I wouldn't what do would anything different. You wouldn't do anything differently? Nah. Nothing, no regrets? I've got, nah. And you wouldn't say, or you wouldn't have said anything, like any bit of advice at all? I said I could say about the drinking one, but... Do you feel like it was a process that you wanted to go, go through anyway? You don't, like, you don't ever want to go through that. No. Um, that is a tough question. I think because I've been through it all and sort of come out the other end, I'm like, I wouldn't change anything. I oh, would. yeah, 100%. Um, but, yeah. Maybe date yourself not to feel guilty. Guilt. Guilt's a massive one. Yeah, like, just talk to people. Like, for years, like... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I would say just go and try everything out. Like, if you want to do a job as a lifeguard, go and be a lifeguard and um, do as much as you can and get as m many experiences as you can. Definitely. Remember, would you give yourself a book? Because when you're when you reading them, because that's what I think that's Kev said. Kev said read earlier. Yeah, I would, you know, it's free, isn't it? I'd get personal development. But then, do you reckon you'd have read it then? Or would you have done it then? Were no. you ready? No. You're not ready. For, like, that's what I mean. We can try and share this message now. And people will just watch it and won't take any action. I think you've got to go through something. I think you've got to go through some sort of trauma or something. So they say, they say, it's not until you go through the worst pain until you take action on it. I think there'll be ideas, oh, I want to do this, or I want to do that. But it's not until you go through some horrendous pain until you t actually do anything about it. Yeah, I agree with you that. You agree with that? Yeah. So, I could, you know, I could try and teach my daughter all this stuff and tell her what books to read. You know, I've got that. I've got a few books up lined up for her that I wanted to read. Yeah. Well, she make some better decisions, but, you know, at the end of the day, she's going to go she for will, it. Uh, like you said, if she sees you doing that, yeah. she'll definitely, like, I've always saw my parents work really hard. Yeah. So, therefore, I've, I've got work ethic. I've got morals, but yeah. that, that comes from my parents 100%. It's scary though, and it's like I walk to school. She, obviously, she's at junior school, and then the other kids are walking the other way. Going to secondary school, yeah. and they're all smoking, swearing. Swearing. And I'm like, I've got two years left of that, because she's not going to want to walk me to walk her to school. Mm. Might be a cool dad now, but in two years, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And she's going to be walking the other way. And it's like, she's going to be in with them kids. Is she going to be smoking? Is she going to be swearing? Or she is she going to surround herself with that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's like and you can't tell her to be friends with me. No. Because they're probably you know they're all good kids. It's just like I've not read that chimp paradox, but have you read that a bit? No, I've heard good things. Yeah, it. yeah I've, I've heard good things about it, but I think like you just go with the in crowd. Yeah, and it's the wrong like, crowd. You know, things should be different. How much difference does it make for you, your people you train and stuff? You said earlier, we were Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I said, like, um, I saw this thing on Instagram earlier which said, How come you've got 20 people you can go for a drink with, but no one you can do business with? I was thinking, God, actually, for me, it's probably the other way around. I've got 20 people I could do, I could ring up and say, I want to do this, I want to do that, I could do business with them. But then, whether I start, I haven't got people I could go for a drink with, or whether they know and I know, that's not really where my interest lies. But it's amazing, you know, who you surround yourself with, what the how big the positive influences are, and obviously for your daughter, like you, you and her mum, probably the biggest influences she has, or you hope that you're the biggest influences she has. But yeah. obviously, she got time at school. And I was thinking earlier when you were, what you're saying <coughs> that uh, for me, I definitely didn't give my teachers at school enough credit, but some of them are the to are the people you spend the most time with. Like when you're young, like my form teacher or my, yeah. particularly when you're really young, yeah. like for my daughter, two days a week she's at nursery. So the people she's at nursery with, the yeah. teachers there, are the people who have the biggest impact on her. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, interesting to think where their influences come from because yeah. you like to think it's you, but sometimes it's other people. Well, we sport used to play football, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And like, obviously you're flying. And, and I was thinking about it, I was like, I used to do boxing, like I wasn't ever really good, but I used to love it. And I think like, I was thinking about my old boxing coach, some of the lessons in life that he gave me. 100%. Turning up on time, discipline, 
all those things, you know, my mum was always working, trying to provide for me, you know, because at the end of the day, they need to pay the bills and put that roof over your head. So I used to go to boxing, I think that like, was boxing coach, John Lally, such a massive impact. Mm. I think like, and encourage all kids to do sports, you know, any sport or go to some sort of scouts or anything like that. Definitely, definitely. I remember when I was a kid, I was always captain of the football team that I played for. Yeah. And I used to think, oh, I'm the best player, I'm captain. I wasn't the best player, if I look back now, but I just had the leadership qualities yeah. that I've still got now. Yeah. And I was taught by the coaches to have my dad. I think that's where I got it from. Yeah. So I'm like, I used to think oh, I'm, I'm the captain, I'm the best player, but really, yeah. if I look now, I can think, I actually apply the same kind of leadership qualities now. Yeah. As lead by example, we turn up on time, try my best, I think that's why I was captain. Yeah. And I was, I don't know, yeah, it's just weird that you said that then, maybe realise, you know, that's true. Yeah. Because exactly. my coaches, they definitely made a big, big, big impact. Yeah. I was going to football. Yeah. I remember I went football training once. <laughs> just woke up. Now I'm like chested down and that, but at the time it come, I just like caught it. Like <laughs> the lads are like, what are you doing? I was like, what? I didn't have like brother or sister or nothing like that. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. crazy. It's amazing. Like, like, so one of my friends, his mum desperately wanted him to be in the choir at school, but he was horrendous at singing and all he wanted to do was play rugby. And uh, basically everyone like went to the like um, choir trials thing and oh, everyone else got in, it's like impossible to fail but they just let you trial anyway. <laughs> basically turned up and the music teacher was like, look, we both know you don't want to be here, you're only here because your mum's so go home, tell her you didn't get in. Yeah. And it's like, that always makes me think about Lilia and like, what does she actually want to do and what do I want her to do? And it makes me think like, I hope I never put her in that position where I'm trying to make her do something that she doesn't want to do. Yeah. And that she, you obviously guide them, but that they actually get to choose what they want to do rather than you forcing them. I, so, my daughter, she's done dance, right? And she's got, as, she had about as much coordination as me. So she was going to all these competitions and like, out of beat with the music and stuff like that. And she wanted to get, like, she's going to all these festivals, doing all these competitions. And she never got any awards and I was just like, it was when I was doing all this and I was like, listen mate, do not quit. You just got to keep turning up and going and trust me, something will happen to you. You know, you will get better and stuff like that. She did a show at the King's Theatre and uh, I was in a dad's dance. <laughs> uh, so like, I, I was like, I need to nail handstand walking. So I was practicing, practicing, practicing. But I was like, don't quit. Like you, something will happen to you. And then, um, on the on the evening they give out awards and she got an award for like hardest working and I was like see mate you you know you're not quitting you've got an award now mm -hmm. like you may not you're enjoying yourself and stuff like that but the next day she had the trophy walking around with it she had the medal on and stuff like that so I was like you just need to be a bit cautious of all those people that didn't get that mm -hmm. award that you're not rubbing their face in it so like teaching them like that because mm. you saying don't quit how many people do you know who quit everything they do in life so would they have said that to their daughter they would have been like oh it's alright don't worry about it yeah. whereas you were just keep going because you understand the process you understand like self-development you know the value of not quitting like Michael Jordan he failed <coughs> I think 25 teams and he, he got let down for it didn't get in the school team yeah. he was the best player ever yeah it's, it's interesting because it's like being a parent gives you a whole new perspective because like my parents whatever I wanted to do whether it was play football rugby hockey whatever sport I wanted to do they'd always help me and they'd always drop me off, sit in the pissing rain, watching me and, you know, pick me up. But then some of the parents I see like on Instagram or on my Facebook and they're moaning about their fact that their kid's going somewhere or oh, I've got to take them to here or I've got to take them there. Whereas I literally cannot wait till Lilia has got something she wants or Frankie's got something they want to do. I can't wait to take them there. And um, it's amazing, like even just that one, like the difference between taking them or not taking them maybe encouraging them to go or not encouraging them to go, what an impact that will have long term. Yeah. Such a big impact. I think my dad watched every game of football that I played. He quit playing football so he could watch me play. <laughs> and that support he gave me, I, I always took it for granted. Yeah. But yeah, well, well now I'm old enough to realise, I'm like, I can only give up everything to do that for me. Powerful, isn't it? Yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts. But then you say about throwing yourself for the right people, we all said that. People are listening, thinking, oh, I can't, there's no one to surround with. You met a lot of people through working at Nando's. 
Yeah, so, so one of the people who, who like helped me the most uh, was such, just a customer at Nando's. And I think that is about how you treat people. Is I remember he came in, there was something wrong, and it was literally I went the extra mile when something had gone wrong to make it right. And yeah. then from then, literally, he came in constantly and then became one of my best friends off the back of it. And then probably one of my other best friends now, had one, I was introduced with him, had one phone call with him like seven years ago, speak to him every day, massive part of my business now. Yeah. It's, um, from literally one interaction, so it's just it's it's all in. <clears throat> what do you think, like law of attraction and stuff like that? Oh, I've yeah, yeah. That as well, big time. I think when you're ready, it, it kind of comes anyway. Yeah. But I still think if you just talk to people, the opportunities it creates is ridiculous. Like, even if like you work in a petrol station, if you talk to the right person, any opportunity can kind of happen. Yeah, like there's a petrol station in Portsmouth. Whenever I go in there, I'm always like, this is the politest petrol station in the world. They always ask you, how's your day going? You know, have you had a good day? What are your plans for the rest of the day? And I'm sure they're coached to do that, and it's like a tip sheet behind the um, mm. thing. But it does make a massive difference to you. Like sometimes yeah. I was, like, actively drive to that petrol station on the way out of Portsmouth rather than go elsewhere because I'm like, I want to give them my business because that's the way they, yeah. But in some places you'll go to get a coffee somewhere, they'll look at you like you're just yeah. a terrorist ordering a coffee. They're like, no, yeah. I just can't, just be nice to people. I think that's yeah. the biggest difference you'll, you'll notice in anything. You'll get opportunities if you're just nice to people because no one's nice. No. Mm. So you you're to, being nice, you stand out. I used to like listen to that thing like, oh, everyone's dead, you know, not friendly down south and all that. Northerners are dead friendly. It's not yeah. true. Or, you know, everyone's busy. You know, people take the time. Southerners are just as friendly as Northerners. It's yeah. like you just don't know what that person's got going on in their life. Absolutely. That's yeah. the other thing with maybe not drinking and being off the alcohol as well. Yes. Yeah. Like, you could want a massive emotional roller coaster. Yeah. And actually, the interaction maybe you have with someone when you're on a high versus when you're on a low would be completely different. Whereas <laughs> I guess giving up drinking, working through what the issues you had, yeah. then you're a lot more on a level and they'll get a lot more of the same interaction whether they speak to you in the morning or the afternoon, Monday or Wednesday, wherever it is. Yeah. That's so true. Amazing. Great Thanks podcast. very much. No really really today. Absolutely. I'm sure <laughs> there'll be room for part two if you're happy to do it. It's been fun. Yeah, no, I've had a great time. Nice, mate. Yeah. Wait, do you want to check out Leon? What's your Instagram name? Uh, the body, at the body Taylor. There you go. Anything else you want to plug? No, just, <laughs> just watch these two lads as well. Eh? <laughs> Cracking journey as well. Exciting times ahead. Exciting times, 2018, let's smash it. I can't yeah. believe you're just driving in your car up and living in your car. <laughs> 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 Cheers, guys.